in game, of course, as to who you think is going to be making the biggest role as Method EU is squaring off against Paint for Femme in Waycrest Manor. All Getting right. underway here. Now pulling all the Celestins at the front. Me meanwhile, though, Femme, they're just going to shroud right to the first boss. Not going to bother doing anything else. Huh. Interesting difference in strategy here, yeah. That's very different. Usually, you would assume that the teams have something that they want to do. Maybe with the obelisks, if they if they plan on pulling those first few mobs. Or maybe it's just a trash count thing. Maybe they've decided that that 4% trash count you get from killing the Solescence at the start of the dungeon is exactly what they want. So, they're going to go ahead and get that. Now, that was a nice little uh, thing we saw from that camera angle there. You actually saw a sap and to paralyze on two of the mobs in the hallway, stopping that patrol, so the second they get this boss down, they're set up to do a massive pull, should they choose to right afterwards. So, a little bit of extra manipulation from Method EU, who we know is very good at doing that mob manipulation in this dungeon. Yeah, it's, po it's possible, actually, that the reason they fought those Solescences was so the patrol would progress to that point uh, at where they wanted to CC them anyways. True. Uh, that's the kind of that's the kind of decision-making Method EU makes where they're like, all right, you know, we're, we're going to choose this pull based on how it's going to affect patrol timings in the rest of the dungeon. I mean, we've seen this as well from them in the last in the last season of the MDI when they kind of took the strategy from the Ch from the Chinese region and also just perfected it a little bit, where we saw when they were dealing with tr finishing off trash mobs in the outside area, we saw Jinji actually run through on his rogue, pull roll, instantly vanish to reset combat, which ended up opening all the doors for them there, so that they could then move on to pull all the trash outside and do a massive pull there. These guys are just really great at that kind kind of typical thing in this dungeon like you just went over. Yeah. Femme making a little bit of progress here, paint for Femme. Although it looks like Method EU actually kind of catching up on boss damage here. They're only about 50% of one of these bosses' health behind, given that they pulled an extra pack of trash beforehand. It was a quick trash pull, but I think that, if you look at the damage meters, yeah, they're, they're damaging quite a bit higher here overall, right? They have two players above 100k. Whereas Pain for Femme has ni neither player above 100k, none at all. Yeah, I mean, that's also probably just due to comp things as well. Like, for instance, there's just little tiny things that happen when you pet pet class. You know, this happens to Warlocks as well, where you have to make sure your pet swaps at target attack targets every single time you need to hit a new mob, and so you could get a little bit of inefficiencies there on the hunter side, although I doubt Shelly's actually letting that happen. But, you know, sometimes these tiny GCDs where you're doing a little bit less damage can add up over the course of a fight. And even though Method EU decided to do a completely extra trash pack, they, uh, they killed the boss within seven seconds of Paint for Femme, so they've got it together in this dungeon so far. Yeah, they paid seven seconds for 4% trash count. Uh, it seems like a worthwhile exchange. Seems like if you could go to the store and uh, and purchase trash count at that rate, you would do it. Yep, that's the case. <laughs> they are now the teams again diverging in strategy here um, with the uh, with the uh, so so method EU they CC a witch and then they pulled all the dogs killed all them out of bolster range and are now pulling all the witches. This is a great strategy on bolstering week, right? Yeah. You want to find mobs of similar health amounts, pull all of them at the same time, CC them up to the different health amount, and then go deal with them at the same time as well. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're textbook perfect, perfectioning this dungeon right now, and it wouldn't surprise me to see some a, a rogue pull the Jagged Hounds to himself off to the side, which which is, I'm pretty sure, exactly what we're seeing Jinji do here. He can go ahead and pull Silbon Goliath, vanish off those mobs, and then they'll have to worry about the, uh, the bolstering from those Jagged Hounds on Matron. They can just deal with the Goliath right now. Easy. Yeah, they're going to skip Maiden Grindle entirely here with that strategy. And they're going to have to fight Soulbound Goliath in a small area here near the fountain, but that should be more than enough space here, uh, especially because nothing like Necrotic is active that would really make this boss fight punishing. It is tyrannical, though. It is tyrannical. It is going to be a long boss, but at the same time, I don't really foresee there being an issue. Now it is a world first raider after all. I hope that he can tank Soulbound Goliath. He just fought Nizoth for a long time. So he's getting in there nice and easy. By the way, what is Nao's name? It's Nao Ayayaya. Ugh, okay. Well, getting through this old-bound Goliath, as they do, it's going to take a while for them to get through this boss. It's really just going to be a patchwork fight, fight at this point. All they have to do is make sure they deal with those Jagged Thorns every time they come out. Pain for Fem is opting to just deal with a lot more trash than Method EU did. They dealt with a lot of that indoor trash right next to the, uh, right next to the staircase, those captains, which are some pretty nasty trash mobs. So they're going to be a little bit behind Method EU is right now. Yeah, they're, they're buying trash count at a little bit of a worse rate than Method EU did, right? We were talking about 4% trash count for 7 seconds. Here, it looks like they're going to be getting something like an extra 10 or so percent over Method EU, but 
it's going to cost them minutes, not seconds, and that is a much less favorable exchange rate. Shelly getting dangerously low from those things from beyond there. So that means he is running over 40 corruption, which is something that we see a lot of players opt to not do in the MDI. You know, typically when you're running these full on settings where you're going for as much trash as possible, you really don't want to give yourself any extra potential damage input and take. And if you ever get double thing from beyond spawns, whenever there's extra damage output going on your group, you have the chance to just fall to them instantly. So it's a little dangerous, but it's, you know, it's one of those trade offs that we see a lot of teams do. And once again, we see Method EU doing that mob manipulation. Door open, so long Goliath is up, and Jelia hops in, paralyzes a mob that they might want to deal with later to keep it in a certain patrol position. And they're just, you know, giving us a masterclass on how to deal with patrols in this dungeon. Yeah, they're death gripping it out. It looks like they're actually starting a trash pull while Soulbound Goliath is still alive. Because, of course, bolstering means they don't want to pull mobs onto the boss at the start of the fight. But if they do it at the end of the boss fight, that's fine, right? Bob's bosses don't bolster when they die. And if the boss dies at the same time as the trash, then there's not going to be any harm done. Yeah, it's I mean, looking excellent for yeah. them. Look at that. All that extra damage they got basically for free on all this trash. A lot of damage coming out, though. I think an explosive went out. Oh yeah, that was definitely an explosive, but you know what? One explosive, what's a little bit of damage? Zelia can heal it up. He's one of the best at it. He's don't he's, he's got no problems for them whatsoever. He is relatively low on mana here, almost completely tapped, so he'll probably have to get a quick drink in here before they move on. But uh, yeah, this moving into this next room, it's going to be a very dangerous pull. We've seen a lot of teams end up going down to these spit debuffs that they get from the maggots in here, so keep an eye on those little green debuffs on the character frame and see how many of them go on one player, because those can knock some players down incredibly quickly. Yeah, for players of this caliber, the ability to actually shadow meld off casts of spit as they're like as they're targeted at you is something that we can look out for. Perhaps uh, if players are getting to, you know, if they have four stacks, you might expect to start seeing them meld if they're targeted again. Uh, yeah. If they don't need the meld for any skip in the near future. Yeah, we did see the cloak of shadows coming out from Genji when he had at least three of them on him. So. You know, you can see the danger in that pull, you know, committing that Cloak of Shadows to this pull, just making sure that he didn't drop down too quickly and that it, they were in a reasonable enough health situation for Zelia to heal them. And looks like they've dealt with it pretty cleanly. That was the entire hallway all pulled at once. So these guys have it going quickly. Now, typically what we'll see next is a certain number of snap pulls, sometimes pulling that Hunter room and potentially pulling all of Rawl's room as well. So I'm interested to see if they're going to use any of those snap positions or they're just going to stack it up normally like they are right now. Yeah, fighting the good old-fashioned way, you know, this is uh, this is how dungeons were intended to work. Glad to see Method EU respecting the, the spirit of the game. <laughs> um, not not using any of those snap spots, yeah. Well, only the cordial gentleman's game of Mythic plus MDI dungeons here out of Method EU. None of that snapping shenanigans. No, right, no remakes here. No. Um, they're, they're able to get through that pull. I mean, part, part of the problem with doing a big snap pull here is a pull of the size to benefit from snapping would start to hurt you in the bolstering department with mobs of these differing health amounts, right? So you've got piglets that have like half the health of the other guys, and uh, if you're pulling the, the Huntsman's Lodge, there are the dogs that have less health than the others as well. Uh, and those, you know, if you're AOEing everything indiscriminately, are going to add more time than they save because of the bolstering mechanic. Wait a minute, I have to choose which target I DPS? I can't just AOE indiscriminately? Well, looking coming soon, you'll be able to just DPS a random five of these. Ooh, only, uh, that's actually that's my gem. I only want to hit five moms at a time. I love that. I'm interested to see. Usually, you, you do end up wanting to snap the hunter's log just because they are all ranged mobs and it's hard to line up sight them properly. So we'll probably end up seeing them do that after roll the gladness. But it's just so weird to see these teams all single target roll down. I'm so used to seeing you know. The entire yeah, hallway across the room pull on top of the boss. And then we're like, oh, the DK is doing 10 million damage. Oh my god, that class is so busted. But you don't really get to see that now. Yeah, no, here the DK is only doing three times as much damage as the rest of the group. <laughs> totally fair and balanced class. I don't get why <laughs> I don't it's get why fine. people say that's so overpowered. It's alright. Yeah. The Huntsman's Lodge, so they're at 62% count here. I wonder if they are gonna pull the Huntsman's Lodge, or if they're instead gonna do more stuff in the cellar area, maybe, like one big cellar pull or something. Potentially. I think it's got to be the Huntsman's Lodge because yeah. of the bolstering being less bad there than in the cellar area, but I think most I of the mobs in the Hunter's Lodge typically have close to the same amount of health value. Now, it's important to, of to mention, of course, that those maggots don't actually bolster since they are considered kind of trash mobs, the, the smaller trash mobs, and in every single dungeon there are certain trash mobs that don't... Uh, get affected by any of the affixes, and that just happens to be one of them. They are going to leave the Runeweaver up as just a potential cleave target, because it's efficient to 
you know, deal with two mobs at a time instead of just one. And they'll just be able to get interrupts on that mob as well. Because like we've mentioned by how many trash mobs people tend to pull on top of this boss, Rawl by himself is really not that dangerous of a boss. Yeah, even if he gets a stack of bolstering, you know, at the end of the fight, it's really not going to be the end of the world either, right? All of his mm -hmm. damage is avoidable except for on the tank, on whom it's very minimal, so... Uh, I like this strategy here. There's a way to save a little bit of time doing a, a you know, finding ways to be efficient, even with bolstering active, can make minutes of difference in one of these runs. It'd be really impressive to see a snap coming out of this guy, some coming out of these guys mid boss from the Hunter's Lodge whenever Rawls at like 20%. I don't think it's not going to happen because, you know, you can, your tank can get to a good snap spot anyways, but, you know, it's something that you could think about doing if you had maybe an off tank for a little bit. It'd be kind of cool to see that. Yeah, Heart of the Wild returning in Shadowlands, actually. Yes. That's that ability that empowers your off, off you know, spec uh, forms as a druid. So maybe you could have a, a DPS druid go bare and, and tank for 30 seconds with Heart of the Wild up. We were uh, wrong. It's a possibility. That'd be very cool. They're not going to the Hunter's Lodge. They're going to an obelisk, and they still have a lot of trash left to, to get. I mean, you need about, you get about what? Is it, it's 20 to 25% from downstairs if you pull everything. So they still need to get some from somewhere. So I'm interested to see what they plan on doing with this. Looks like they're bringing the obelisk back out into Rawl's room, not bringing it down into the cellar. Oh, they're so doing, maybe they're they're doing they're... double obelisk. They uh -huh. the other obelisk. So they activated, yes, they've activated the uh, the courtyard obelisk at the same time here. So they've got Urgroth, Breaker of Heroes, the tank buster, and Sam Re Beckoner of Chaos, the fear guy, both active at the same time here. This is a good combination of enemies to fight at the same time because Urgroth doesn't really come with extra enemies that require being killed. Mm -hmm. And actually, if somebody like a DH goes and activates his obelisk, all those little growths that he puts on the ground that slow you down and are really annoying, they don't really do much because the rest of the group isn't there and the DH just eventually trades over it and, you know, situation handled. Yeah, the DH is mobile enough and enough of a hero class to where it doesn't have to worry about ever getting meleeed by this breaker of heroes. Even though it is a hero class, it can't actually be broken. So Yeah, that's yeah. breaking my immersion a little bit here. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know about that one. That name I'm gonna I'm gonna call it Tank Buster from now on. I don't like the, I don't like his real name. But yeah, like we mentioned, is and this is these are usually the two mobs that you don't really want to deal with on that final boss, especially since they don't really have a fantastic way of dealing with that tank smash since they don't have a hunter. Now, like we mentioned earlier, the Demon Hunter can taunt Netherwalk or Tit, but, you know, it only deals with one of them. Yeah, fighting last bosses with awakened enemies with explosive active kind of becomes a little bit of a house of cards situation where, you know, adding one extra awakened boss and the explosives it spawns might cause one explosive to go off and turn an otherwise doable situation into something completely impossible. Um, so I think, you know, if Method EU is, is deciding to do two obelisks here in Baycrest Manor, that's probably the right number with, uh, with bolstering active and explosive. Yeah, but at the same time, there's, obvi there's there's definitely a chance of it not necessarily being the best strategy, too, and that's the interesting thing about this Awakened ethics is I'm sure there's out there, there's some big-brained 200 IQ person who can come up with an <laughs> insane strategy that will just be the best thing to do for a dungeon, and that's what's so cool about this Awakened ethics. You can come up with these interesting pathways, and if you're able to pull, up, pull off you know, three or four obelisks on the final boss, you can save a lot of time doing that as well. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this ends up you know, working in the player's favor moving forward. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's not a solved thing by any means, even in these dungeons that have been out for a couple of years, and now actually going down while they're fighting the Matron there. They are going to expend a battle res on him. That's fine, they still have one of those available. That's a large Matron. <laughs> that she, certainly was, she uh, was big. She was not messing around, uh, as they discovered. Yeah, and I mean, you know, just having one small tank death, you know, that's kind of the thing. You know, it's a little uncanny to see these really weird deaths out of Method EU. Fortunately for them, it was at the end of the pulse, so it wasn't that big of a deal anyways. It looked like it was more of a safety or a time thing for them. But, you know, no big deal for them. End of the pull, go right next into this next trash pull, pulling everything in uh, Lady and uh, Lord room, and just getting it all down quickly with that unholy KOE, even though they're the lowest on the damage meters. Yeah. <laughs> no, never mind, spoke too soon. <laughs> there we go, they're, they're spiking up there. Yeah, Death and Decay hits the battlefield, and that is going to be the Death Knight spiking to the top of the AoE damage meters. Normally, you'd be able to do this with Lord Waycrest active and chunk him for, you know, a health bar, but it's not available as a strategy when bolstering is, is up, so we're going to have to do it uh, the old-fashioned way here, do this boss by itself. And you know what's really impressive about this is even though it's bolstering and explosive and they can't pull mobs on top of the bosses, they're still blazing through this dungeon. This is going to be an incredibly quick time even with these nasty affixes. I mean, it just goes to show you how much of a character, you know, damage spike output spike you get from having all these corruptions available. You know, there are some classes that are doing 
triple the damage they were doing in the last MDI exper in the last MDI tier, just because of the, the extra item level plus the corruption as as a as a boost to your character. It's kind of ridiculous how strong characters are now. Yeah, it, it, you know, it hasn't affected all specs the same, but some of these specs are scaling with stats in such favorable ways. Um, it, it really, you know, it's interesting because the defensive side of the things has kind of gotten a little bit worse, right? Like. You know, if you have a bunch of extra haste or crit as a DPS character, all right, that's going to make you do more damage. It's not going to necessarily make you live any better. And now you have these corruption drawbacks uh, that you have to deal with. So you've actually kind of gotten much more damage dealing, and also you're taking more damage um, and more, you know, less defensively set up. And I think that's something that goes to show just how strong these players are in all of these teams, because one of the biggest problems when you go from MDI season to MDI season is that your character's actual damage output goes up, but its ability to take damage typically doesn't go up at a same skill. Usually you get a lot more powerful damage-wise than damage taken-wise. So even though these guys are blasting through the dungeon, having no issues, you gotta understand, these guys are on the brink of death every time. You know, one small thing goes wrong, they will go down to probably a one or two shot. So these guys are playing incredibly well to not have any deaths in this dungeon so far, with only one on the side of Method U. Yeah, the exception to that is the tanks, of course. The tanks do have defensive value, True. and a lot of it from their corruptions with those uh, versatile effects. You know, we originally thought that Twilight Devastation was going to be a tank thing for tank damage, uh, but outside of a couple dungeons, they've generally been going with the defensive versatile options to allow them to pull big enough to let the DPS actually, you know, make good use of their corruptions as well. Yep, and I mean, you know, Lord and Lady Wicrest going down easily. They even pulled that last mob at the last second, which is something they've pretty consistently done on every single one of the bosses so far. Zalia, that was a mistimed ring of peace. We all saw that, and we all had to look at it, so... You know, be a little better with the timing next time, dude. Fortunately, not going down to that, only getting taken to like 15%, but a little bit of a spooky moment for him there. Yeah, the, the ring of peace against these mobs to prevent that jump is, uh, it's, it's a little bit tenuous because sometimes the mobs, if the ring of peace is between you and them, sometimes they're still just going to jump right through it. And so you got to be careful. Yeah, fortunately, no deaths for them on this pull, and that, you know, I feel like that should have been a death, but just able to barely get through that. And now they'll have just, uh, is it one or two? Two obelisks on this final boss to deal with because they dealt with both, as we saw the Tank Buster and the Fear Mob earlier on. Yeah, one battle is available. Bloodlust gonna be popped right on the pull here for Method EU as they get into this final boss fight. They've got the Spider and the Blob active, so they're interrupts and they're gonna be losing space on the ground here. This is a pretty tough boss fight for the Blood of the Corruptor to be active during because of the area denial in a fairly small room. And we'll see if they're able to deal with that against these tough enemies. Yeah, I mean, they're definitely going to take that out first because there is there is not enough room in this boss room for there to be pools on the ground. So, of course, the second that, that Blood of the Corruptor goes down, they'll get all that space back. But uh, they're just going to be able to AoE cleave most of these slavers down with their comp. They've got a lot of incidental cleave with Blade Flurry from the Rogue, with the general cleave that Demon Hunters have from their Blade Dance and I-Beam. And then, of course, Unholy DK is doing Unholy DK things with their stores. There's just a lot of incidental cleave going out, so they shouldn't really ever get too far behind on those slavers. Yeah, I think that once the initial burst of this fight is over and what, once they've dealt with that Blood of the Corruptor, they should be fairly stable and that it looks like is playing out here for them where the slavers aren't really overwhelming them. I think the slavers can become a problem if you ignore them because you're killing the awakened enemies at the start. That's something that can be problematic on this boss fight, but if you can burn that first wave of slavers, kill the first wave of awakened enemies, you should be able to deal with the last 50% of the boss's health, generally. Yeah, I think the only time we'd ever even consider them being in trouble with the slavers is if there's, like, more than two of them. If they start getting three or more and they have to start using their AoE CC to stop those sun casts, then they might be in trouble. But uh, outside of that, there shouldn't be much else going on for them because they've dealt with all of those awakened mobs. Now, I want to point out, Pain for Fem, they're not too far behind Method EU. They've had a very clean dungeon so far. They've had zero deaths, but I think their routing and maybe just their overall damage might have been a little bit lower, which probably they, could have been the difference between the Hunter and the DK. They are also still missing enemy forces percent, so oh, Pain for Fem afterwards is going to have to go upstairs to the Huntsman's Lodge, and I think when you factor that in, we start getting maybe over a minute in difference yeah, yeah. between these teams. You're right. But you're right that you know it, it has looked fairly close. There's just a few spots, a few splits in particular. I think the way that Method EU handled the moving into the courtyard area, they saved a lot of time there. In addition to the double awakened mob pull, I think that was a really good in Rolls Room when they pulled the two awakened mobs on top of each other. That was a that was a very good variation. Now, of course, Gorak Tool does go down for Method EU, and again, Method EU a very clean run with one tiny hiccup, but allows him to go up 1-0 against Pain for Fem. Game and over what has been. Like you mentioned before the series started, 
Waycrest Manor being a very grueling dungeon, a very challenging dungeon that doesn't always allow them to do all the strats that they want. Method EU put together an incredibly clean and quite quick dungeon run as well to be successful there. God knows, I mean, let's start breaking that down a little bit bit by bit because what they were accomplishing was definitely not easy. Yeah, there was a lot of management of bolstering in particular that I think was really impressive out of Method EU. There was these moments where they would pull enemies right at the end of boss fights, and they had these things perfectly timed, such that they would pull enemies when the boss is at like maybe 30% for one boss, 20% for another boss, and then have them come in and, you know, the boss dies just in time so the bolstering doesn't become a problem, but they still get that efficient effect of fighting a boss with a big trash pull and getting to use a cooldown offensively on both those targets at once. And I think that those little advantages really added up throughout the dungeon. Yeah, and it really just, and this is also the method EU that we really have come to know and expect, having such a substantial lead over their opponents really early on there, Zyro. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, just these tiny little, you know, method EU is really good at using tiny little routing issues or routing changes to get an advantage on their opponent. We've seen them do it throughout the entire past year, and they're continuing to do it now. All those little paralyzes, those 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 blinds that we saw coming out from Zalia and, and Jinji were just the tiny things that let them get ahead in the dungeon. It was really great to see them do that. Yeah, it goes to show how how we've been expecting this team to to be doing so well and to be able to take that kind of victory is always so cool to see. So, Jonas, let's start breaking down some of those replays as well. I think Tettles may have to uh, replay. Uh, Excuse <laughs> me. I was looking at looking at number one on the list. There we go. Hello, Tettles. Jack. Uh, I got the replays. <laughs> but yeah, but it was like the guys were saying. It ultimately, it just comes down to pulling even health mobs all together. Uh, Method, you did a really good job of making sure that they were pulling like the dogs uh, separate from like the thorn shapers whenever they were in the courtyard area. And like Dratnus was saying, it was pulling those um, low health, uh, like those mobs at the very bottom of bosses. Method EU and Paint for Film seemed like they were relatively close, like going into Lord and Lady Waycrest. Unfortunately, there was still like the count discrepancy. Paint for Film still had to deal with the soul essences, whereas Method EU had done them at the very beginning of the dungeon and were already okay with it. But crafting a route for a Waycrest Manor that involves bolstering and you like have to deal with just all of the like other kicks that are required with the dungeon is pretty complicated because a lot of the time the strategy for that dungeon is actually just run double death knight and blow up all of the courtyard trash with uh soulbound goliath blow up all of raw's trash with raw and honestly method of use strategy for how they ended up uh pacing through that dungeon was really good they did an incredible job and that's going to bring us into game number two which will be on workshop and zyro seeing just loads of hunters in this dungeon quite consistently uh, overall, this dungeon has been pretty hard stomped by a lot of teams so far. And we already saw a good run in Workshop from Paint for Fem, so we know that they That's have true. a good strategy in here already. But we talked about this earlier. Method EU has two premier hunters on their team that played Hunter in Method, which is one of the best guilds in the world. Like, these guys are going to be hard to beat in that dungeon. Yeah, man, it's cool to see these guys who generally main hunter are actually able to play it in competitive in their tournament realm and everything like that right because this is something that's really been quite fresh for uh the, the hunter meta that is yeah Jinji had kind of been locked into playing stuff like rogue for you know previous mdis and now he gets the opportunity to hop back on the hunter same, same with miras really happy to see them both get to play their like favorite class and have it be the meta meta pick for a season yeah, and Workshop in particular is always quite interesting because we talk about how, okay, this dungeon isn't too terribly trash heavy. There's a lot of focus on single target and everything like that. But seeing some of those polls, especially when they're bringing it into uh, Machinist Garden, for example, or how they're setting up the end boss, we had some really close calls in Pain for Femmes run their earlier titles, but just having the Dwarven Racial at the ready when they need yeah, it. Yeah, that, that Dwarf Racial is actually just so clutch in this run, and I expect... I, I think it's like super reasonable for them to both of their tanks to be playing that dwarf. I think it's good that Paint for Fem actually has practice on this dungeon already that they played it today. That that may give them a slight advantage over something like Method EU that hasn't. Maybe they don't have enough practice. Maybe they haven't seen like how everything's going to function in terms of playing it on stage. So maybe well, maybe Paint for Fem can show us and be more consistent. 
Yeah. But I mean, we'll have to see because I'm quite curious as to how much these teams have been practicing for this specific matchup. You know, Pain for Femme, obviously, they really want to make sure they're staying in the upper bracket as long as they can. You know, Method EU had their mistakes in their first series, but now they're firing on all cylinders at this point. It's ironic. I think this might be the, the dungeon where we really see them start pulling away in Workshop. Yeah, I mean, I think I think we're going to see the same thing as well. But, you know, I'm still holding out. I think Pain for Fim has a shot here because we've already seen them have a good run in this dungeon. But based off of the way that Method E has been playing in these past couple matches that they've played, it's going to be a close match, I think. And so far, that's really been kind of the name of the game with the European region so far. We've had, you know, a limited amount of like three game series but there's been so many dungeons lately Drenus, that it's been very close there's one or two mistakes or something like that and then that's it yeah paint for femme in workshop and is a great example of that where they managed to win by seconds uh in their earlier series with a pretty sloppy run right there were uh, a buck and a half in there yeah six, mm -hmm. six deaths uh, so we'll get to see are they going to execute that same strategy method are you going to try and do something safer are they going to try and do something equally difficult or are they going to go even more you know aggressive and try and get something even faster than Paint for Femme's potential best time. Yeah. Paint for Femme That's gonna right. get the clutch dwarf racial on uh, King Mechagon. Hey, hopefully they work out that timing, but we'll have to see as game number two between Method EU and Paint for Femme gets going in the workshop. Yeah, we see the Lightfoots coming out from every single one of the members as they get into position to take those tongs underneath the hammer so that they can slam it down. Ooh, Jimmy, Fragment's dropping incredibly low, procking the cheat death right away in the dungeon. Fortunately, he shouldn't need that for quite a while afterwards, but that was a little bit of a spooky moment. That trash pad can be a little RNG with when those mobs cast detonate. Sometimes they'll cast the other ability instead, and you'll have to sit there for a little while longer, but looks like it went nice and cleanly for both teams. Yeah, you also want you want to make sure that you stack nice and under them so that you bait the rocket barrages onto the mobs because the mobs don't only take damage from the hammers, they also take damage from that rocket barrage. Uh, so getting the whole group under there, making sure you don't interrupt the rocket barrage, that can really get you through that pull in seconds, as we saw from both teams. And they're into the first boss fight. Yep, similar strategy from both teams here. Make sure No Mercy gets targeted onto this first hammer so it can take a little bit of damage. Every single one of those hammer smashes will do a little bit of damage to No Mercy as well, so you can get a little get it down a little quick more quickly. And uh, yeah, they're bursting down No Mercy quickly. It's looking like he's doing about 20% of the mob's health every single time, which is uh, an awful lot, if I have to say. So already done with No Mercy and onto the Platinum Pummeler, I think before it even got rid of all of its debuff stacks. Yeah, they're attacking that thing. I think I, I think you're right with the stack of platinum plating on it. Yeah, yeah, that thing is getting absolutely shredded. Method EU is uh is getting through this pretty quickly, I have to say. And Mira's really ate his Wheaties today. Look at his damage numbers. That is Jeez. insane. He's just better at getting procs than uh, Genji is, I guess. Yeah, I think his barb shot's working a little better. Yeah, some, sometimes you just get a little bit more skill procs whenever you're playing the game, and we're seeing that out of Mira's right now, but man... That was a quick boss out of Method of you already moving on to the rest of the dungeon. I mean, you gotta remember, it is fortified, but still, that was a lot faster than I think we're used to seeing. Yeah, both hunters are playing, so they're both playing Blood of the Enemy Major from Method of you. So there's, it's not, there's not an element of Vision of Perfection procs complicating this. It is just the resets on Barb Jot that'll be a difference in their damage. Yeah, and I wonder what they're waiting on. Oh, they're, are they waiting on, oh, they're waiting on Mira's and, uh, and now to catch up there as well. And I wonder what that waiting was for, because... That was a lot of spent time spent waiting for them. Maybe they just got bad RNG when they were in the sewer there or something, but that was a little weird to see them standing there for a solid 10, 15 seconds before they set up this trash pack. Yeah, on the other hand, you know, it, it's more important to set up the trash pack correctly than to pull two seconds earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if it's a trash pull is as intricate and dangerous as this one is with explosive active and those living wastes, I think it makes a lot of sense to, you know, wait until, <laughs> wait until the tank is there to pull. Um, but you're, you're right, it's... I wonder why it took him lo a longer time to get there than everybody else. And this is where we're going to see some of that hunter damage come out in these single target situations in the dungeon. Ooh, Jinji getting nailed by that frontal there as well as Zalia. They're going to have to use a battle res on him, but they're not going to be able to get it off for the venting flames. The boss, yeah. Uh, that's going to be scary. Ooh, they're going to be fine, it looks like. Nope, J uh, Fragments goes down. They, they, I believe they do have the res on Zalia, so he'll be able to take it after the, the venting flames, but this is not a situation you want to be in, and that explosive almost went off for them as well. As long as they're able to clear the rest of this trash, they'll be able to get through the boss, but it's going to take them a lot of extra time. Yeah, this is really the, the thing that we were seeing from Method EU earlier, where there was a little bit of uh, a little bit of things going wrong for them in the middle of their run. Uncharacteristic for Method EU, a team that normally doesn't have these kind of mistakes happening all that often in their runs. 
Now, I'm curious, because I'm not exactly sure how this mechanic works, but I know that if you get targeted with that leap ability by Cujo, um, if you if you vanish if you vanish when he's jumping at you, he stops jumping to everyone else. I wonder if you can use feign death for that same for that same mechanic. Do you know if that's possible? It is indeed possible. Okay, that is that so is good. a play that works. Yeah, that uh, invisibility from a mage, all of those sorts of. I think even shadow meld is oh, yeah. uh, something that will do that. So a lot of options here to stop Cujo from jumping around, uh, which is nice because it does a moderate amount of damage here, even on fortified when it hits that. It's better to have it not jump, and it also makes it easier to do DPS effectively because the thing isn't just moving all over the place. Yeah, while we were fawning over what Method of You was doing, it looks like uh, Pain for Fem ended up having a full wipe at some point in this trash pack on their side, so even though Method of You is down a DPS for this boss, they're still slightly ahead in terms of where they are in the dungeon. They have the same trash percentage, but they're 40% ahead on the boss, minus a DPS. So Pain for Fem will get a little bit of time to catch up. And as we just saw from Method EU, we saw Mira is running out as far as possible, feign deathing before uh, before the boss jumped to him, and the boss stopped jumping. Perfectly ex executed by Method EU. Yeah, unsur unsurprising to see them perfectly execute, you know, boss mechanics when the boss itself is the only thing alive, right? Uh, it's when the ads start being present at the same time that things get scary. See, Mira's took about 70% of HP. He was trying to get a little feisty and peek around the box for a kill command while that venting flames is going off. Not something you want to mess with, because that can do a lot of damage to you. Fortunately, he didn't end up going down, so no major well, there, issues there. There are some spots next to those boxes where you can hit the boss, but the boss can't hit you. Right. Uh, and I think he was just slightly on one of the spots where he could hit the boss, and the boss could also hit him back, and he ducked back into the safe spot. Um, to be able to continue doing damage, but not take any damage. Did you see that little jump spot there that they found? I, I didn't know that was a thing. The, the, did the I. hunters disengaged up on top of that platform underneath the, the the conveyor belt, and then they jumped up on top of the pipe, then on top of the conveyor belt, completely skipping most of the flame gauntlet. I didn't even know that was a spot you can jump up to. I know you can do it as a demon hunter with double jump, but I didn't know you could do that as a hunter. That's pretty interesting. You can also warlock gateway up there from, uh, from the conveyor belt to the later parts of the conveyor belt. Yep. Nice little piece of utility. Yep, 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 but we're never going to see a Warlock in the MDI, so haha. <laughs> what do you mean? Shelly literally played Warlock in one of the time trial runs for uh, for Paint for Femme. Uh, that was a typo. That was a typo, okay, yeah. Yep. <laughs> There's, uh, yeah, accidentally, you know, log into the wrong character and start at the key. True. By accident. We've all been there. Yep. In True. and out to the trash gauntlet area here. Both teams at fairly close, uh, fairly close to each other. Method of you, maybe 30 seconds ahead or so? Yeah, I mean, they're just, you know, getting on with it. They're, they're doing the same thing that they always do. They Even 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 with the tiny mistakes that they're making, they, they're they just clean in the rest of the dungeon so far. These guys are playing incredibly well. And I mean, it also helps that Paid for Fem had the full wipe on their, on their side as well. But it just looks like the way Method of you is playing. And, you know, it's the same as Perplex. They're just playing better than everyone else right now. Yeah, Method EU and Perplex were far ahead of the other teams on their time trial times. They were there was a huge gulf between one and two seeds, and then three through eight, uh, and three through eight were all fairly close. But one and two, Method EU and Perplex were way ahead. So, not surprising to see them doing you know in accumulating these incremental advantages throughout the dungeon by just being a little bit faster, pulling a little bit better, doing a little bit more damage. And of course, both teams are now in this unskippable gauntlet where you have to deal with several types of trash mobs. Of course, this Blastatron is the final mob that you have to deal with. You gotta play a little Tetris at the end sometimes here and uh, make sure you don't get hit by any of those blue glow, you know, slates. But it looks like Method EU knows how to play this game. And uh, did I say Tetris? I meant Simon Says. Yeah, I was about right. to ask what you thought you Tetris know what? was. You, you, you know, we, we all know <laughs> what I meant. I just said the wrong game. It's okay. But they get through it just quickly. It looks like both teams know how to play that game, so they're totally fine. And, uh, they're opting to go for the obelisk strategy here rather than, uh, you know, taking the gauntlet on normally. I think that makes a lot of sense here because the gauntlet itself costs quite a bit of time. So, you know, the upside of skipping an obelisk is very little given that you're going to have to do a gauntlet anyways that takes about the same amount of time. May as well remove the obelisk from the end boss fight given that it's free. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and also, you know, it's not really it's not really one of the dangerous mobs when, that you think about whenever you talk about pulling these awakened mobs with bosses, but it's just the one that happens to be there in a certain situation. So, you know, why not take the portal with you? Yeah, you would prefer for that one to be one of the, like, you know, Samrak, ideally. Samrak, Beckoner of Chaos, the fear guy. Uh, but it's... <laughs> you don't get to choose which obelisk is where. That's, uh, yep. Blizzard's It's hard to put it in. Yeah. 
It does actually change from week to week, though. A couple of the a couple of the Diablos switch position every couple of weeks. Yeah, there are two setups, right? So you yeah. can swap between the two. And that one is one that can that alternates between being Spider and being the, uh, the Tank Buster. Right, right. So maybe in other weeks we'll see them run that as well, and it'll be a little bit better RNG for them. Yeah. I, I, I think that the Awaken Patterns is set for the whole NDI, but I'm not oh, sure. Oh, maybe. That's true. Well, we did, we did change the Beguiling uh, Patterns up from week to week last time around, so it wouldn't surprise me if we see that change a little bit from week to week, too. You never know. We'll see going forward. But uh, both teams onto Sparkflux at roughly the same time here, with the same trash count as well. Just Method EU, once again, just slightly ahead, making sure that they're dealing with those trash packs as well. Now, the thing about this is they don't get to sit inside that generator, and Zalia does go down because of it. That's they have really no battle res for, for, looks like, 30 yeah. seconds or so. No battle That is a lot of time to not have a healer, especially when you're playing True. Beast Mastery Hunters. Beast Mastery Hunters not really able to sustain themselves if they take any damage. So that gun is going to come out, the, the Blossom Plant, uh, and that thing needs to be killed very quickly because otherwise it will murder one of the DPS players. They well, managed to handle that and they're able to dodge most of the avoidable damage now. Yeah, that's the thing about this fight. Almost every single source of damage on this fight is avoidable damage minus, minus the Blossom Blast plant, which does target the closest person. And we saw the second that spawned, now instantly charged over it to make sure that he was the one taking damage from the plant. So great heads up play from him knowing that was the only way they could wipe on this fight. And as long as they're dodging gears and don't get hit by the fire blasts, they should end up being fine on this fight. But as the fight progresses, there are more and more gears and more and more damage going out, so they have to be careful, and they do end up using that battle res just as a safety net. Yeah, a little scary to cast that B-Res there. You know, they don't have any classes with the battle res in their composition, but the Tournament Realm does feature the engineering battle res now, which is a new addition for this season of the MDI. Really happy to see that because it makes these kind of comps much more viable. But a drawback of that B-Res is that it casts for four seconds. You're just standing there on this fight, you know, these saw blades are floating around, you just gotta try and find a time to spend four seconds channeling that res. Can be pretty scary, can be done in Cloak of Shadows, so that's the kind of thing that rogues are really good at. Rogues are, are one of the best carriers of that engineering battle res. Yep, and also, once again, we're seeing them completely ignore the blood of the corrupt, corruptor art of, uh, obelisk and move on up to these second spider tanks. And like was mentioned earlier in the cast today, if you kill the further along spider tank, that is the one that starts the RP that lets you go to the final platform. So we see them focusing that spider tank down first, and then they'll deal with the second one on later on. It looks like Pain for Fem is not actually doing that. They're cleaving them down pretty evenly. Okay, they're focusing Skull down a little more here, so both teams are have the heads up that the RP is going to start that way. And uh, then we'll move on to the final platform. Yeah, you know, you, there's not a huge benefit to killing it 30 seconds ahead of time. You want to roughly even cleave them, except you want to kill the, the correct one. You know, just enough extra time ahead of time so that the thing lands right as you exit combat. Yep, I mean, ex perfectly executed. Now, if I'm not mistaken, these guys are a little lower on trash percentage than we normally see from your typical pug runs here. They're going to have to end up pulling almost all of this platform, which is full of some incredibly dangerous mobs, so we'll have to see if they're going to go down here. These are actually pretty much the exact same type of trash pack that we saw Zalia die to on Spark Flux, so they need to make sure that they're staying inside those damage reduction zones whenever those squirrels are out here. Yeah, or, or dodging the squirrels, but the problem with doing that then is you're going to take full damage from the short out AoE, mm -hmm. which it's survivable, but it's not pleasant, so staying in the shield generator is a nice thing to do. You do have to be careful, though, because sometimes those will despawn on you, and you're just standing there relying on it to live against the squirrel, and uh, it despawns, and you're left feeling a little silly. Yeah, sometimes that's... Yeah, sometimes you can get a little debated by the, uh, by the shield generators, and it's not the best feeling in the world, but it looks like these guys are practiced enough to not have that happen to them, so good on them for that. No major issues on this first trash pack for either team so far, and they're going to have to deal with some more trash afterwards. Yeah, well, they're, so they're going to go on to the boss fight, I think is the next order of business. The question is if they're going to do the obelisk. Right now or if they're just going to skip directly to the boss and it looks like method eu are just going right over to the boss as we see pets being dismissed which is oh, yep. the classic sign yep. that you're about to try and do a shadow melt skip that's it uh, and um, they all have shadow melt available and uh, fragments of the vanished since he's not a night elf so they should be totally fine there and uh yeah they're just going to do perform a skip here and deal with this three obelisk boss pull it's going to be a little bit scary, but a little squirrel coming in to say hi to them as well. They're going to have to move a little bit before pulling the boss. But yeah, this is it. This is all it for Method EU. And both teams are getting to the boss at the exact same time. The only major difference here being those two extra dust on the side of Pain for Femme. Whoever pulls off this pull more clean is going to be the winner of this dungeon. Yeah, both teams are on the exact same composition here, so there shouldn't be too much of a difference in their damage profiles, player skill aside. The player skill will play a huge part in what's going to happen in this boss fight. Both teams now fighting against three awakened enemies and the boss at the same time. Looks like they're, uh, so Method of you is choosing to focus the blood of the Corruptor. 
so they can stop having to move around as much. I see a little bit more even cleave coming out from paint for them, although I'm not quite sure. Well, that makes a little bit of sense, as long as you have ways to deal with the fear circles, right? That's the major thing here. If you, if you can deal with the fear circles on every single one of your characters, then you're not too worried about that mob and you can go for an even cleave. Now, it makes sense to, it, it, honestly, it makes sense to target down the Blood of the Corruptor because there is a lot of area of denial on this fight with those orbs being you know, pushed around the room in random, in random circles. You really don't want to have to you don't really want to have one of your ways to move blocked off by one of those purple pools, and it can get really scary really quickly whenever you have no place to run. So, big scare coming out of Pain for Fem. Lots of people dropping low from them. Yeah, oh, Fem so low again. Does have stone form available to, to drop those necrotic stacks and become healed. But once again, he's made it back to his stone form, uh, and he should be feeling safe now because he has access to it if he needs it. Looks like he decided to kite for a little bit. And that worked out for them pretty well. Method of you, though. Wow, absolutely neck neck on health on the boss here. But Method of you does have those 10 extra seconds in their favor because of the two deaths that happened for Paint for Femme and not for Method of you. I mean, Method of you has the 10 seconds in their favor as well, but because they didn't have to move as much because they focused the Blood of the Corruptor down, they were able to actually get through the other two mobs more quickly instead of, you know, which is kind of weird because usually when you're even cleaving things, you would think that that's be the more fastest way, right? DPS. Yeah. But the thing is, when they're running double hunter and they both have that rapid re reload trait, all you need is three targets to take advantage of that trait. So it makes sense for them to focus one down and then get access to the rapid reload trait on the two mobs without having to move around so much. So just little small efficiencies like that. Method EU is, you know, pretty big brained with it. Yeah, although Beastmaster Hunter is not a class that loses anything from having to move. Uh, interesting that that was the strategy they ended up on, but it, it looked really good. Oh yeah. I'm not sure I would have thought of it though. Like I, I think I would have probably defaulted to focusing down either of the other two awakened mini bosses first. There, uh, that goes to show why I'm here and Method of You is there. Though. I, you know, it's just more of a safety play, right? It's just you know, the the, the number one thing that's going to kill you on this fight is going to be have is going to have nowhere to run whenever you're targeted with one of those lightning orb shifts like you see right now. And making sure you have the most room possible to move out of those is almost always going to be the safer play to make. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, during the cooldowns, you know, they, they get through that while the healer has all, all the stuff rolling, and then uh, Blood of the Crusher is dead, and the healer has some time to plant as well and actually be able to cast the longer cast time spells. And uh, man, this this is actually a lot closer than we thought it would be between these two teams. Now, Paid for Fem, they did have not exactly the cleanest run in their earlier match. They did have six deaths. But if they didn't end up wiping earlier on in the dungeon, they could have taken it. I think they would have won here, yeah. They would have taken it. Method you had a pretty not clean Cujo, uh, but they end up managing to be slightly faster here. This is going to be something like a 20 or 30 second differential at the end of the day when you factor in the deaths in their favor as well. But that is going to be Method you taking this one down, winning the second map and the match against Paint for Femme. With a very quick 2-0 victory, Method EU is now going to be moving on into the upper finals and showing why they have been such a stellar and consistent team. Like you guys were mentioning.